We're going to go ahead and get started. If we can have everyone's attention, we are so excited to be doing Ignite Talks this year. And Ignite Talks are going to be six-minute presentations from five people. And when, when we say Ignite, it's sort of like a shortened TED Talk. And so we're going to have some slides along with these presentations. And we have um, five fabulous people who are going to be sharing their wisdom with us today. So our first presenter is Catherine Gazarowski. Did I get to get that right? OK, great. And she's going to be talking about adopting the public health approach or how we learn to stop worrying and love community needs assessments. <laughs> so Katie, if you want to come up. Awesome. Can everyone hear me? I have a relatively loud voice, so if it feels like I'm shouting at you, I'm sorry. It almost feels like an advertisement. Come to my discussion roundtable later. OK. Um, I was actually in California three weeks ago on vacation. I liked it so much, I decided to come back. Um, and while I was there, I was in a different part of California. I was in um, Northern California, about an hour north of San Francisco, which is very different geographically and culturally from Southern California. And I got to go to a park and see the California redwood trees, which I'd only been dreaming about since I was a little girl. Don't ask me why. Um, has anyone here ever seen California redwood trees? They're just, they're, they're incredible. They're magnificent, they're glorious, they're awe-inspiring. They render you speechless. You walk into this forest and there's just this hush and this silence surrounding you. And um, what I found most intriguing about these trees is that they have this ability to heal themselves. That whether it's an ax cut, an earthquake, a forest fire, a tree disease, um, they find a way to regenerate over a series of days, decades, centuries. And over the course of time, um, a thousand years later, you would never know that that tree was damaged. And so this is really a story about healing and empowerment in the state of Indiana. So in Indiana last summer, our coalition against sexual assault had to close its doors. And that left programs without funding, left programs without support to do direct services and to do preventive services. And, um, you know, the Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence stepped in to take on the most critical services needed, including the rape prevention and education program. So when I stepped in, bright eyed and bushy tailed, straight out of graduate school, with no idea what I was getting myself into, I realized I had seven programs scattered across this lovely state of Indiana and also scattered on a spectrum of knowledge and understanding of what primary prevention is and what the public health approach to preventing violence is. So what to do? <laughs> um, as funders, we have the capability to force change using our funding stream, but we really didn't want to do that. We wanted to empower programs to find their own path, to realize on their own that maybe their prevention strategies weren't aligned with the risk factors facing their communities. So. We had each program do a community needs assessment. It was built into their funding this year that they had to do a community needs assessment. And through that process, they were able to realize, oh, maybe my prevention strategies that I'm currently doing are not addressing these needs, not addressing these risk factors, not enhancing the protective factors that may exist already. But there were also some unintended outcomes, some really great outcomes. There are now programs who are partnering with other community organizations that they typically wouldn't partner with. Housing coalitions, poverty work groups, the mayor of their community. There are programs that are looking at built environment, social norms, they're looking at parks, they're looking at neighborhoods, they're looking at the culture of their community. But most of all, they have hope. These programs were worry, weary, they were discouraged, they were hurt personally, organizationally, professionally last summer, and now they have confidence in their ability to actually prevent violence in their community, when before they really weren't feeling very confident in that. Um, they're excited and energized about the work ahead. They're building new partnerships and finding new resources. They're building new roots in their communities, roots of safety, roots of community connectedness, and other protective factors that we know can change the story of their communities. And just like redwood trees regenerate and heal over time, 
Um, through the power of community needs assessments, these programs have sort of found themselves on the path of recovery after a rather tumultuous summer last year. And I think that that's something really magnificent, glorious, awe-inspiring, and awesome. And I know that I totally didn't do six minutes because I'm nervous and I talked really fast, but <laughs> please feel free to stop by this afternoon and talk to me a little bit more about community needs assessment, about the power and the healing power that it has, but also about redwood trees.